Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our second seminar which is joint seminar between a Center for Advanced Food and Genomics and Sydney Nano Institute. And thank you very much for those who join us again after the nine o'clock. Uh, but as we said, all of you will receive the recording of the session so you will be able to review this at your leisure. Before we start a formal proceedings of our meeting today, I would like to acknowledge traditional owners and the custodian of the country of the land at which we meet at the moment. For me, it is the Garigal people of Eora Nation. I'm Wojtek Szanowski and I'm a deputy director at Sydney Nano Institute and also associate professor at Sydney School of Pharmacy. Word nano is derived from the Latin word dwarf, which in a technical terms means very, very small, seriously small. And at Sydney Nano Institute, our mission is to harness the science at nanoscale and influence our economy, society, and everyday life. And today we will be learning about how the nanoscience can transform our food, how this could contribute to the sustainability of the food and the food supplies. So now I would like to introduce uh, my co-chair, Diana Bulgeva, who will introduce the Center for Food and Genomics and also our distinguished speaker. Over to you, Diana. I'll stop. Thank you, Wojciech. Uh, the Center for Advanced Food and Genomics is a multidisciplinary center aiming to provide uh, innovative industry-focused solutions uh, that are transforming food products and processes for nutrition and health. Uh, the center tried to address uh, global issues arising from, uh, as we know, growing and aging population, increasing chronic diseases, uh, and is also oh, yeah. helping with uh, different solutions for the Australian food industry to deliver safe, sustainable, secure, and competitive food supply. It is uh, now my pleasure to welcome our special guest, the distinguished professor David Julian McClements. He's a professor at the Department of Food Science at the University of Massachusetts. Um, there are many broad expertise he has, but to narrow it a bit, uh, he specialized in uh, food biopolymers uh, and colloids uh, with uh, an emphasis on uh, using uh, structural design principles uh, to improve food quality, safety, shelf life in nutrition. Over to you, Julian, it's our pleasure to have you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for everyone coming back. Uh, I think we had some problems with the time change when the clocks went back here and went forward where you are. Uh, I think since I last spoke last week, we've had, it was like almost summer last time I spoke to you. Then we had a huge snowstorm. So it was like middle of winter and now it's like summer again here. So I was sat on the hammock this afternoon. So very strange weather. And, and I think the politics is even stranger than the weather. So we're still waiting to see what's happening in our election. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about, um, just give you a broad overview of food nanotechnology and how it can be used uh, in, the, in the food industry and agricultural industry to try and improve the food supply. And I'm going to give a, um, a few examples from our research and just show you um, an overview of other kind of research that's been done. So if you look at uh, sort of food nanotechnology or nanotechnology in general, you know, when did it first start? And it's, it's been put down to this um, lecture by Richard Feynman which was uh, in Caltech in California in 1959, he gave a lecture called, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Uh, and this is where he started talking about, you know, engineering things on a mini minuscule scale to try and get novel functionality and materials. Um, what, that first talk by uh, Richard Feynman, people uh, largely ignored it and they didn't really link it to nanotechnology, but I think later they, they did. And I think the person who really popularized nanotechnology was uh, Eric Drexler, who was, um, worked at MIT. And he wrote a number of, sort of influential um, research papers and books uh, about nanotechnology. And he was talking about you know, some really wacky things like nanobots, you know, like tiny robots that can go through your, your bloodstream and do engineering and things like that. Uh, and I think Michael Crichton, who also wrote Jurassic Park, Park wrote a book called Prey, which was turned into a movie where these nanobots went wild around the world and started taking over you know, humanity. Uh, and at the 
at the same time, there was a big debate between Eric Drexler and this uh, aptly named Richard Smalley, which is a great name when you work in nanotechnology. And he was really criticizing Drexler and saying that, you know, some of the ideas he had were just too wacky. And he was, Richard Smalley was really coming up with some practical ideas of how you could use nanotechnology and like drug delivery and to make novel materials. And I think it, as it's turned out, Richard Smalley was much more accurate than us seeing nanobots taking over the world. So we also see sort of shrinking things into a nano size or, uh, in popular culture. So if you look at some of the um, movies that have been out, uh, one of the ones I used to watch in rainy England, so I came up, was brought up in Northern England and on Saturday or Sunday afternoon, there was nothing to do. So I used to watch lots of old science fiction movies on the TV and one of them was The Incredible Shrinking Man. And this was uh, this person who was on a boat and he went through a radioactive cloud and he started shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And as he got smaller and smaller, he could do lots of things he couldn't do before because of his small size. So he could get into dolls houses or he could fit into tiny cracks in the wall. So he could, do, so he, there may have been some benefits of being smaller, but at the same time, he had to fight off like giant um, spiders or cats. So there was also disadvantages of being small. And that's the same thing in food nanotechnology. When you shrink food ingredients to a nano size, there are some benefits, but there are also some risks as well. And we have to carefully evaluate those when we're using nanotechnology in foods. So if you look in the food area uh, and just look at um, the number of citations in, which contain the word food and nanotechnology or nanoparticle, you can see that up till about the year 2000, there was hardly any publications at all in this area. Uh, or citations and but over the last sort of 10 or 20 years there's been a huge um, increase in the number of publications so this has become a, a really hot topic in the food area and, and then this nanotechnology has been used for all sorts of different things now so if we look at um, foods and we look at the the kind of particles we get in them we get all sorts of different particles and that's what contributes to the desirable appearance and texture and flavor profile of foods uh, so usually in the nano range, you, you, you're talking about somewhere between like one and a hundred nanometers. So one nanometer, you're, you're close to individual molecules like um, a sucrose molecule or a protein molecule. Um, but in the nano range, you have things like micelles, which might be in things like beverages or inside the gastrointestinal tract. We have casein micelles, which might be in milk. We have some fat droplets in homogenized milk and hydrocolloids and various other kinds of particles fall into this, this range. And then we have some bigger particles as well, which wouldn't be considered as classic nanoparticles because they're, you know, bigger than about, say, 200 nanometers. So just to get an idea, like, how big are, are nanoparticles? You know, so if you look at, say, a pumpkin, so I've got a pumpkin here, it's Halloween in, in um, New England, so we have pumpkins on the doorstep. You know, if you were standing on the moon and you looked at the planet Earth and I held this pumpkin up in my garden, you wouldn't see it because this pumpkin is very tiny compared to the planet Earth. It's about 10 million times smaller than the planet Earth. Now, if you compare a nanoparticle, this is not a nanoparticle, it's a tomato, but if this was a nanoparticle, this would be 10 million times smaller than a pumpkin. So a nanoparticle is as small compared to a pumpkin as a pumpkin is to the Earth. So that just gives you an idea of how tiny nanoparticles are. Uh, so what's incredible is that we, even though they're that small, we can still fabricate them and characterize them and use them for different functional purposes. So let's just have a quick look at some of the different types of nanoparticles you can get in food. Uh, we can get all sorts of different nanoparticles and these are some examples of organic nanoparticles. So they can be made out of fats or lipids, so things like surfactant micelles or fat droplets you get in milk. Uh, we can have things like, they can be made out of proteins, so like casein micelles or protein nanoparticles which you can make or they can be made out of carbohydrates. So things like nano starch and nano chitin and nano cellulose um, can be made out of polysaccharides. And we can um, find these in nature or we can create them and then we can use them for different functional purposes to change the appearance of foods or the texture or the bioavailability of ingredients. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So a lot of the organic nanoparticles, um, they can be natural or nature derived. So often, when you talk about putting nanotechnology in foods, a lot of people are, oh my God, we've got nanoparticles in foods. We can't do that. You know, that's going to make everybody sick. 
but nature has been putting nanoparticles in foods for millions and millions of years. So if you look at you know, breast milk from a mother, or if you look at the milk from cows, they've got casein micelles in. And these casein micelles are, are 50 to 500 nanometers. So the smaller ones are in the nano scale range. So these are specially designed nanoparticles, which nature has created to, in, to incorporate proteins and phosphates and calcium in a form that can get digested quickly in your body and release all these nutrients to feed the growing infant. So just because something's a nanoparticle doesn't mean it's dangerous. Uh, you can also get other kinds of nanoparticles like the oil bodies you get in um, oil seeds. So things like soybeans, if you look inside soybeans, they've got these tiny uh, nanoparticles uh, in there, which are like fat surrounded by phospholipids and proteins. And these can be in the nano uh, range as well. Or we can break down sort of bulk materials like cellulose and we can create um, nanocellulose or, or nanochitin using things like acids or alkalis. So these are isolated from nature. Alternatively, we can do, make engineered nanoparticles. So these are nanoparticles that we actually create ourselves. So I come from um, a small town in Northern England. We have a great big titanium dioxide factory near the house where I live. So they make these tiny titanium dioxide particles. And these are um, about the same size as the wavelength of light. So they scatter light very strongly. And they also have a very high refractive index, which makes them very good light scatterers. So if you look at like the paint on my wall, uh, the white paint has got lots of titanium dioxide in to make it look very bright. But we put the same particles in foods. So lots of foods like um, chewing gum or, or bakery products or the, or the dust in you have on donuts has got titanium dioxide in to try and make it look really white and bright. Um, and there's some concerns about that because lots of kids eat those kind of products and, and there may be some um, problems with that. Uh, or you can make organic nanoparticles. So you can make, again, out of proteins or lipids. So in my lab, we use microfluidization to make nanoparticles out of lipids. Uh, and then we put these into foods. So if you're a food manufacturer, you might intentionally make these nanoparticles, or they may just occur in the food product unintentionally. So you didn't mean to make them, but just by the normal processing operations, they end up in your food. So when we're making engineered nanoparticles, what we're trying to do in the food industry is to create some novel effects in our foods or we're trying to improve food quality or food safety or the nutritional properties of foods. So to do that what we can do is we can engineer these uh, nanoparticles and change their characteristics. So we can change their particle size, we can make them smaller or larger, we can change their shape, we can make them spherical or, or cubes or fibers, we can change what they're made out of so we can use different types of fats or proteins or carbohydrates we can change their surface chemistry uh, by using things by, like layer-by-layer layer electrostatic deposition, or we can change their electrical characteristics. So we can make them positive, neutral, or negative, and change the magnitude of the charge. Or we can change their aggregation state. And all of these things change the way that the particles behave in the food and in our bodies. So now what we'll look at is, you know, why, why do we want to use nanoparticles? What's unique about them? Um, so what, what gives them some, some interesting functional characteristics? So one of the, the most important attributes of nanoparticles is their very, very small size. So just like, like Ant-Man, which is one of the comics I used to read when I was a kid in England, uh, used to shrink to a tiny size so that he could do things that he couldn't do in his normal size. The same with um, food ingredients. If you take a regular food ingredient and you can shrink it down to the nano size, it'll behave very differently than a normal food ingredient. So for example, if you're trying to deliver a bioactive component uh, to the human body, if it's small enough, it can penetrate through the mucus layer and through the epithelial cells and get absorbed into your body, whereas a larger particle wouldn't get absorbed into your body because the pores in the mucus layer that caught our gastrointestinal tract are about 400 nanometers. So if the particles are small enough, they'll get through. And the same with things like the um, microbial cells. So they're covered by a coating, and if you make the sm particles small enough, you can get them through and penetrate into the microbial cells. Uh, and even things like food packaging, we put nanoparticles into packaging materials and they can diffuse out. And in that case, it could be a problem because they might get into your food. So one thing is a very small size. The other, uh, unique characteristics of nanoparticles is a very high surface area. So if you take a, a, a given mass of a material and you make it smaller and smaller, um, then you, your, the surface area increases. So 
that can change the um, behavior of the, of the food. So for example, in foods, there's lots of things that happen at the interfaces. So for example, lipid oxidation in lots of food products happens at the oil water interface or lipid digestion happens here. So as you increase the interface, you may increase lipid oxidation or lipid digestion. So in some, so some cases that's beneficial, in some cases it's detrimental. And the last thing that could be unique about nanoparticles is you can change the surface chemistry, is when you make things smaller and smaller, you get a bigger surface area. And if you look at the molecular interactions of a molecule at the surface of a material, they're different than the molecular interactions in the bulk of the material. So things like the melting point or the boiling point or the density or the chemical reactivity of the molecule changes when it's at a surface. So as we make things smaller and smaller, we can change the surface chemistry and change the way these particles behave. Okay, so that gives you some uh, sort of background to you know, some of the unique characteristics of nanoparticles. Now what we'll do is look at some of the potential applications. And we'll start looking in agricultural applications. So there's a lot of different things that people are exploring in this area, and I'll just highlight a, a few examples. So one of the big areas is this development of nanofertilizers or nanopesticides. So, you know, typically we would add fertilizers, you know, to try and provide nutrients to agricultural crops to help them grow and improve the yield and improve their resilience. Or we could add nanopesticides to try and stop bacteria or molds or yeasts or insects from destroying the foods. And there's a potential by making these fertilizers or pesticides very, very small, we can change their efficacy so we can make them work better or we can use a, a, a smaller amount of them so we're gonna have less pollution um, in, in the environment. So for example, when you make particles very small, they can get into the pores of plants. So the big particles can't get inside the plants, but the small particles can get into the plants. And often, uh, the nutrients need to get inside the plant or some of the pathogens of the plant might be inside the cells and if you have a big particle it's difficult to get in there but if you have these nanoparticles it can get in there and it can kill the the, the bad things or it can provide nutrients or you can functionalize the surface of these nanoparticles so they maybe stick to the plant more strongly and that prevents them running off into the environment so so people are looking at a, a lot of things in that area so I'm just going to show you one example here. This is from um, Dr. Jason White, who works at the Connecticut Experimental Station for the US government. Uh, and he's done a lot of work on um, the application of nanoparticles to agricultural crops. And this is an example where he compared uh, copper nanoparticles with conventional copper uh, treatments of plants. So what he did is he applied the copper nanoparticles in the conventional treatment, and then he let the plants grow, and then he measured the, the yield of the plants and the health of the plants. So what he found is if they use the nanoparticles, you got much more growth and got a higher yield than if you um, use a conventional formulation. So this is an example where using nanotechnology, you could you know, improve uh, yields and resilience of plants uh, and therefore have some benefits um, by reducing food waste and you know, be growing enough crops for everybody. Um, so in my lab, we've been interested in trying to make more um, sort of environmentally friendly pesticides. Um, and one of the things we've been using is uh, essential oils and other kinds of phytochemicals that you find it naturally in plants. So plants have developed these essential oils partially to protect themselves. So they, they, they've, they're an oily substance which has got antioxidants and antimicrobials in it. So it can help um, fight against things like viruses and bacteria and pests that might attack the plant. But these are very oily substances, so you can't just um, apply them normally. You have to make some kind of aqueous formulation out of them. So what we do is we make nano emulsions where we have these essential oils in these tiny particles, which are you know, a few hundred nanometers big or smaller. And then we apply them to uh, agricultural crops or we put them into foods and we see, can they kill the bacteria? So this just gives you uh, one example of those kinds of uh, nano emulsions. So, what we did is, in this case is we made nanomulsions from uh, MCT, which is a, a neutral oil, and we made them from pure carver coral and then from a mixture of the two. If you make them from pure MCT, which is almost like coconut oil, they have very little antimicrobial activity. So this is a minimum inhibitory concentration. That's a, the, the smallest amount 
of the nanoemulsion needed to kill the bacteria. So you can see this one is not very effective. If you use pure carbocrol, it's very effective, but the formulation is very unstable and it breaks down very, very quickly. If you get the right mixture, you can make something that is very effective antimicrobial and it's also physically stable for a long time. So a farmer can keep it and apply it to the crop when they need it. So the, the important thing here is to formulate the product right. And if anyone's interested, this is because of something called Oswald ripening. Um, so making these antimicrobial nanomulsions, you can design them so that they will deliver the antimicrobial agents to the bacterial cell wall. So this would be a bacterial cell wall. Uh, and you can do that through a number of different mechanisms. And it's believed that these essential oils, which are hydrophobic molecules, um, can interfere with the um, biochemical um, pathways inside the cells. So things like in interact with enzymes or DNA and things like that, and therefore damage the inside of the bacteria, or it can disrupt the cell membrane. So these hydrophobic molecules get into the phospholipid bilayer, they break it down and then all the cell contents come out. But the other thing you have to be careful of is when you're making these kind of formulations is you have to make sure you work out how much you need to put in agricultural crops. So this is an experiment we did recently where we made a, an essential oil nanoemulsion and we made different concentrations of the formulation and then we sprayed it onto agricultural crops. And what we found is if you use low concentrations, you don't damage the crop and you can kill the bacteria. But if you use high concentrations, you actually kill the crop. So it's really important to get this right, the balance between um, antimicrobial efficacy and making sure that you don't reduce the yield of the crops by killing them because you damage the cell walls of the plants. So another application we've not worked on, but which is an important one is for water treatment. So this is gonna be a huge problem in the future as you know, water, like fresh water becomes scarcer and scarcer. So we're either gonna to have to be able to desalinate seawater so that we can use it in agricultural applications, or we're gonna to have to reuse the water we're already using, or sort of minimize the, the amount we're using, or reuse it. And nanotechnology can play an important role here. So for example, you can make these uh, uh, nanofibers, and you can make them into nanofilters. Uh, and then these nanofilters have got very high surface area, and they have a very small pore size. So what you can do is you can use them to clean up water. So you can remove um, things like viruses or uh, bacteria from water, or you can use them to collect desirable organic matter. So things like proteins and carbohydrates, and maybe you can reuse those um, components for animal feed or something like that. So you can reduce waste and improve safety and then reuse your water. And you can also functionalize these nanoparticles. So you can um, make them antimicrobial or antiviral uh, in order to um, get extra, um, extra functionality in it. And just to give you an idea how you make them, uh, we have one of these in our department, you can do some electrospinning. So you can put like a polymer solution in a syringe, you, um, you have a, a voltage between the tip of the syringe and a collection plate, you can squirt out the um, polymer solution, it will form a very um, thin stream of polymer, the solvent will evaporate and eventually you get this sort of fibre mat uh, and then you can use this as a nanofibre. Uh, another area that we don't work on, but some of our colleagues have worked on is, you know, developing nano sensors. So this is trying to develop sensors that you can use, you can either put into the soil or you can put into the plant. And what it will do is it will tell you the health of the plant and it will tell you things like environmental conditions. So things like the temperature, the humidity, uh, the, the pH of the soil, the nutrient contents, moisture content of the soil. So you're continually collecting detailed information about the agricultural crop. Uh, and then you're putting it in a big database and you're using things like artificial intelligence to relate the environmental conditions to the, the yield of the crop or the amount of crop that's damaged. And you can even do sort of like personalized um, agriculture where you can um, just focus on one plant and give it exactly what it needs. So the idea is that you just water the plant when it needs watering and not just randomly, or you apply fertilizers and pesticides exactly where they're needed and when they're needed rather than just doing it indiscriminately like once a week or something like that. So again, that should lead to bigger yields and loss, less waste, but also less use of things like pesticides and fertilizers. And one of the interesting applications I saw in a talk a couple of years ago is somebody had actually got carbon nanotubes and put them inside the plants and they could send a signal out about the health of the plant. 
uh, which seemed like a really interesting idea. So then let's look at some of the applications of nanotechnology in foods. So again, there's a whole series of different ways that you can employ nanotechnology to enhance the food supply. And I'll just give a few uh, examples here. So one of the ways is to make sort of food ingredients invisible, which sounds a bit weird, but you can, you can do. So for example, say you wanted to make a transparent um, beverage. So you want a clear beverage and you want to put an oil soluble component in it. So normally when you want to put an oil soluble component in it, it wouldn't mix with the water and you would just get a layer of oil on the top. Or if you use conventional homogenization technology, you would make something that's a few hundred nanometers and it would scatter light very strongly and it would look something like milk. So it would look very creamy. But if you use special um, fabrication methods, you can make a system which has got fat in it, but it looks transparent. And the way you do that is by making the particles very, very small, so much smaller than the wavelength of light, they scatter light very, very weakly, and therefore they look clear. Uh, when the particle size is about the same as the wavelength of light, they scatter light very, very strongly and the sample looks turbid or cloudy. So this is a, you know, one application which the beverage industry is already using to put all soluble flavors and colors and vitamins into sort of beverage kind of products. And this is just some of the work we did in our lab where we were trying to make different kinds of um, delivery systems for nutraceuticals, so in this case, curcumin. And we've made like phospholipid nanoparticles or protein nanoparticles made out of zine or lipid nanoparticles made out of corn oil. And you know, in some cases we can make transparent systems uh, that we can incorporate into sort of clear beverages. In other cases, we need to get the particle size smaller. And then we've also looked at the bioavailability of the um, nutraceuticals in these different systems and the chemical stability of them in these different systems. And they're all slightly different from each other. So you have to choose the right kind of food grade nanoparticle for the particular application you're working on. Another thing you can do is to use nanotechnology to increase the shelf life of foods. So I live in New England and in New England, we have like a big uh, microbrewery craze. So everybody's trying to make the new kinds of uh, beers using all sorts of weird and interesting ingredients. But you often see like you get these precip precipitates in or sediments in beer and you get them in other kinds of food products like dressings or plant-based milks and things like that. So using nanotechnology, you can try and improve the shelf life of these products uh, and improve the stil stability of the products by making the particles very small. And there's two ways you can do that. One is to, it helps prevent particle aggregation. And the second way is it helps stop creaming and sedimentation. So we look at creaming and sedimentation first. So if you have a particle in some kind of food product, you typically want it to stay stable so the product looks homogeneous. But, but any particle, there's two different forces that are acting on it. One of them is gravity, and that will tend to create, make the particles move upwards. And then the other one is Brownian motion. So this is like the random collisions by the molecules in the solvent around it. And this wants to randomize the system. So this wants to make it homogeneous. Uh, Brownian motion wants to make it homogeneous and gravity wants all the particles to go to the top of the product or to the bottom, depending on the density difference. So what you find is that gravity increases as the particle size increases. So it becomes, so things will tend to separate more quickly as the particles get bigger, whereas Brownian motion tends to increase as the particles get smaller. So when the particles are small, small enough, the gravity forces are very weak, the Brownian motion is very strong, and you can prevent um, creaming or sedimentation from occurring. You can also change the stability of particles to aggregation. So when particles aggregate, they often cream or sediment faster. So this was an experiment we did a few years ago where we made protein stabilized emulsion droplets and we made them either large or small and we calculated the colloidal interactions between them. And what you find is if you have very small particles, the colloidal interactions, so the attractive forces between the particles are very, very small. So these are so small, these attractive forces that the emulsion stays stable and the product uh, can have a very long shelf life. If the particles are bigger, the attractive forces are much stronger and then you tend to get aggregation and creaming of the, of the droplets. So again, this is an example where making the particles very, very small, you can improve the, um, the shelf life of a product. So that was looking at the physical stability of um, foods. 
So the other thing you can do is improve the chemical stability of um, food ingredients. So this is an example where we have a nutraceutical called curcumin, which comes from turmeric, which is supposed to have lots of health benefits. And we dispersed it in water or we dispersed it in an animal emulsion. So if you put it in water at around neutral pH, it will tend to chemically degrade very quickly. If you put it inside a nano emulsion, it's much more stable. And the reason for that is because um, the, the chemical reactions occur in the water phase. So when this is surrounded by water, it undergo, undergoes certain types of chemical reactions which causes it to degrade. If it's in the oil phase, it, it's not in contact with the water molecules anymore and it's much more stable. So what you would think is, oh yeah, nanotechnology makes things chemically more stable. But you have to be really careful. So nano is not always good. So this was on a very sort of short time scale, like a 15 minutes. If you actually kept those nano emulsions for much longer times, you can see that you do actually get degradation over long-term storage. So this is an experiment where we put curcumin in different types of emulsions. So we made them in large emulsion droplets, or we put them in small emulsion droplets. So this is a nano emulsion. So if you put them in a nano emulsion, they tend to degrade very quickly. Whereas if you put them in a large conventional emulsion, they degrade much more slowly. And the reason for that is, as I mentioned before, curcumin tends to degrade when it's in the presence of water. And there's always like a dynamic equilibrium between curcumin on the outside and curcumin on the inside. So when you have small droplets with a big surface area, this exchange occurs very, very quickly. If you have larger droplets, this is a much slower exchange. So these molecules are much more stable. So I think the important thing here is, you know, you have to design the system very carefully. So nanotechnology is not always the best solution. So it, you have to use it on a case by case basis. Uh, this is a, a, um, some work that we did on trying to make foods healthier by reducing the calorie contents of foods. So what we wanted to do is to make things like sauces or salad dressings or mayonnaise and things like that, which looked, had a nice sort of creamy texture, but they had a much lower fat content. So what we did in this experiment, we made up two types of protein stabilized emulsions at pH seven. And one of them was stabilized by lactoferrin, and that's positive at pH seven. And the other one stabilized by beta lactoglobulin, which is negative at pH seven. And then we um, either, we, mixed, we either used the pure proteins or we used a mixture of these different emulsions. You can see that if you had pure beta lactoglobulin, so all the particles are negative, you had a very low viscosity and this product was like milk. So you could just pour it. If you had pure lactoferrin, it was all positive. And again, it had a very low viscosity and you could just pour it. And this is because the droplets have got a high charge and they all repel each other. And therefore um, you don't get any aggregation in the system. But if you mix these two oppositely charged particles together, you get, they aggregate with each other because of electrostatic attraction. And they form a three dimensional network that extends throughout the whole product and you get this sort of paste-like or creamy-like product. So you've got a very, very low fat content, but you've got a very high viscosity. Um, so typically to get this kind of viscosity, you would have to have maybe 40 or 50% fat in there. So this is a, a potential strategy for making reduced calorie foods that could address things like obesity and uh, diabetes. Okay, so the, the last area I'll talk about is things like using nanotechnology to increase the bioavailability of bioactive compounds in foods. So these are things like vitamins or minerals or nutraceuticals. So nutraceuticals are these uh, natural uh, molecules that are found in foods that have all, almost act like pharmaceuticals. So they have some health benefits if you eat them at a sufficiently high level for a sufficiently long time. And at least it's claimed that they've got some health benefits. Uh, so things like resveratrol in grapes or wine or curcumin in turmeric or capsicin in red pepper or um, the carotenoids like lycopene in tomatoes. So what we're interested in is, can we incorporate these bioactive components into foods to make foods into functional foods for improved health? So what we do normally is we take these nutraceuticals, we encapsulate them in these um, nanoparticles, and then we incorporate these nanoparticles into uh, functional foods. And what we're interested in is trying to understand what happens to these nanoparticles inside the gastrointestinal tract. So, so really there's different levels of nanotechnology you can use here. So first of all, you need nanotechnology to make your functional food. 
So you have to develop some like lipid nanoparticles to put in your um, bioactive agent. And then when you eat them and they go through your gastrointestinal tract, the food gets digested by enzymes and acids and mechanical forces. And you get a new set of nanoparticles formed inside your gastrointestinal fluids. So you get things like micelles, um, which are about five nanometers big, and you get things like liposomes, which are a few hundred nanometers big. So we've got these new kinds of natural nanoparticles formed in your, in your gut. And then these get transported through the mucus layer, they get into your epithelial cells, and then they get into the sort of cellular apparatus, like the, reticular, the endoplasmic reticulum, where the um, fatty acids and monoglycerides are reassembled into triglycerides. And then these triglycerides are packaged into a new form of nanoparticle that your body makes. So in this case, it's lipoproteins. So they've got fats and bioactive agents in the core, and then they've got phospholipids and proteins on the surface of them. So, and then these will tra travel through your lymphatic system, get into your bloodstream, and then carry these bioactive molecules around your body. So what you're trying to do is use nanotechnology to control the food, the digestion, and the formation and uh, size and characteristics of these lipoproteins to try and make foods healthier. <clears throat> so when you're making these nanoparticles and you're trying to encapsulate things in them, one of the most important things you've got to think about is the composition of the nanoparticle. So this is three types of nanoparticles we made. They all had the same fat content. They all had the same particle size. And the only difference between them was they were made from different types of oils. So we solubilized carotenoids in each one of these. And then we put them through a simulated gastrointestinal tract. So we simulated the mouth, the stomach, and the small intestine. And then we measured the bioaccessibility of the carotenoids in these delivery systems. When we put them in corn oil, you've got a very high bioaccessibility. When you put them in MCT, which is like coconut oil, you've got a very, very low bioavailability. If you put them in orange oil, you can, didn't get any bioavailability. And the reason for this is because of the different digestibility of these lipids and the different kinds of mixed micelles formed. So if you have something like MCT, it's got medium chain fatty acids in it, and they only form small micelles, and the carotenoid is too big to fit in them. So it tends to form crystals, which are not bioavailable. If you have corn oil, it has long chain fatty acids in it, and they form a big hydrophobic domain that the carotenoids can get into. Uh, so they can be solubilized and then carried into your body and absorbed by your body. If you have orange oil, it's not digested because it, it's not made out of triglycerides. So this shows you it's not just the size that's important, it's also the composition of the nanoparticles it has to be carefully tailored to the particular kind of uh, bioactive agent that you're trying to deliver. Uh, this is some trans uh, transmission electron microscopy we did just to, to look at this effect. So we looked at different types of fatty acids and the kind of mixed micelles that they form in the gastrointestinal tract. And you could actually measure the thickness of each of these bilayers um, formed inside the mixed micelle phase. So you could actually calculate what kind of uh, bioactive components could be solubilized into these hydrophobic domains. And that's going to determine the um, bioavailability of these compounds. So we said the composition is important, but also the particle size is important. So we've made different um, nano, uh, emulsions and nano emulsions of different lipid droplet sizes and encapsulated carotenoids in, and then measured their bioaccessibility, again using a simulated gastrointestinal tract. And you find that if you have smaller particles, you get a significantly higher bioaccessibility than if you use larger particles. And the reason for this, or part of the reason for this, is because smaller particles have got a much higher surface area, so they tend to get digested much more quickly because there's more um, area for the lipase molecules to absorb to. Uh, if you've got large emulsion droplets, they get digested more slowly. So this is uh, important because if you don't get full digestion, then the carotenoids can be trapped in the non-digested oil. In addition, you get less mixed micelles formed, so you've got less solubilization capacity in the gastrointestinal fluids. So, so far, all the experiments I talked about there were done in, in vitro using a simulated gastrointestinal tract. So we've also done some animal studies where we've fed different types of uh, emulsions to animals and then measured uh, markers of um, bioactive agents that get absorbed by the body. So in this experiment, we looked at two different things. We looked at the size of the particles, and then we looked at the composition of the particles. 
So you can see again, like as you get smaller particles, you get a higher bioavailability. But you can have small particles, but if they're made from a non-digestible oil, so this is mineral oil, the bioactive components don't get released because the fat doesn't get digested. So again, this highlights the importance of size and uh, composition when you're formulating these systems. Okay, so, some, so, so far I've been talking about using delivery systems to encapsulate nutraceuticals that are isolated from nature and then to incorporate them into functional foods. So some people would prefer to, eat, to leave the bioactive components in the, the natural food product. So for example, you might want to eat a carrot because carrots have got carotenoids in. So, but what you find there, if you just eat a, a carrot on its own and you measure the amount of carotenoids that get into your blood, it's very, very low. So most of the carotenoids just go through, uh, through your body. So what we came up with is this idea called excipient foods. And what we wanted to do is develop, use nanotechnology to create a new generation of foods that if you ate these foods with fresh fruits and vegetables, that you could actually boost the amount of these healthy compounds that got into your bloodstream. So what we envisaged is that these foods could be something like a, a nano-enabled cooking sauce or nano-enabled cream that you put onto your fruits and vegetables or nano-enabled salad dressing. So our idea is that if you take these together, you're going to boost the um, bioavailability of the um, nutrients in the foods. So, so again, uh, just like we can with other kinds of nanoparticles, we can create these excipient foods and we can play with the composition and structure of the food. So we can change the fat content, we can change the composition of the fat phase, we can change the type of emulsifier that coats the fat droplets, we can change the particle size, or we can add additional ingredients, so things like collagen agents, antioxidants, uh, efflux inhibitors, and things like that to these foods to try and uh, improve the bioavailability. <clears throat> so this is uh, an experiment where we made these sort of nano-enabled salad dressings, and again, we used an in vitro digestion model, and we measured the um, bioaccessibility of the carotenoids, like in carrots. So you can see that if you just had the carrots on their own, you got less than about 8% of the carotenoids were, would actually be in a form that your body could absorb. But as you added more and more fat to the system, you got a higher and higher bioaccessibility. And that's because the um, fat gets broken down into mixed micelles, and then those mixed micelles can solubilize the uh, carotenoids that are released from the uh, carrots. And again, you have to be careful how you formulate your excipient foods. So we did a similar kind of experiment where we used something like coconut oil, fish oil, and corn oil. And we had exactly the same particle size, the same fat content. But again, you can see you get a huge difference in bioaccessibility. So again, if you use corn oil, you have these long chain fatty acids and they can solubilize the carotenoids that are released from the carrots. But if you use coconut oil, you can't fit the carotenoids into the hydrophobic domains and the mixed micelles formed in your gastrointestinal tract. And again, we looked at the effect of particle size. So again, as you make the particles smaller, you get a higher bioaccessibility for these systems. So what this suggests is that you want to have very small particles and you want to have them um, made out of an, a lipid that's got long chain fatty acids in, and that will give you the best um, bioaccessibility. So again, all those experiments I talked about so far were preliminary experiments that we did in the laboratory. So more recently, we've actually done some human studies. So my colleague Hong Zhao, who's a really brilliant professor in my department who does a lot of work on nutraceuticals. So he did some experiments where he um, tested this idea on students. And what he did is he fed, he, he had four groups of students and he fed them different meals. So one group of students, he gave a pure salad with no salad dressing uh, in it. So if you just had the salad on its own, you got a very low bioavailability. And then he took the salad and he just put black pepper on it. If you put pepper on it, again, you get a very low bioavailability. Uh, if you take the salad and you put our nano-enabled emulsion on there, so that would be like this case here, you've got a much higher concentration of carotenoids in the bloodstream. So we took blood out of the student's arms and we measured the amount of carotenoids that got into the bloodstream. But what was really interesting is if you fed the salad plus the nano-emulsion plus black pepper, you got an even higher amount of carotenoids absorbed into the bloodstream. And the reason for this is because 
black pepper contains this molecule called piperin, and piperin um, acts as an efflux inhibitor. So it can bind to proteins in the epithelial cell and stop the carotenoids being expelled from the epithelial cells back into the gastrointestinal tract. So this really clearly highlights how you can use food science to really boost the uh, healthiness of foods um, using sort of nanotechnology principles. So I've been through quite a lot of material, but you know, that's only the tip of the iceberg of how nanotechnology is being used. And I think there's lots of really, really interesting applications still waiting to be developed uh, and, and lots of other ones that people are waiting on, uh, working on. So things like trying to make nano-enabled sensors, which can give you information about the freshness of uh, fruits or vegetables so that we can, um, we can reduce food waste by eating foods when they're high quality and, making, uh, and only throwing them out when we know that they've gone off or have been contaminated with organisms. Or we can make sort of active or smart packaging. So we can use nanotechnology to put um, antimicrobial nanoparticles in packaging that slowly leaks out over time so that it preserves the, the food for longer. Or we can use nanofibers, so things like nanocellulose or nanochitin to strengthen packaging materials. So we can make biodegradable packaging materials to replace plastic and all the problems you have with conventional plastic. So the challenge is to make these economically uh, uh, viable and also to make them robust enough to actually use in real food, real food applications. But I think there's been a lot of progress made in this area. Uh, and the last thing I want to mention is sort of uh, food, nanotech, food nanotoxicology. So we've done a, a little bit of work in this area. Uh, and there's, a, you know, especially in Europe, there's been a lot of concern that when you make particles very small, they behave very differently inside your body. Uh, so if they behave differently, they might behave in ways that we don't expect. So they could have potentially some toxic effects. Um, I think this is, um, I work in, um, I have a joint position with Harvard University and I work with uh, Philip Democrito there, who did some really um, great work on toxicology on nanoparticles. And a lot of the work he's done has shown that there, there, there doesn't seem to be a big concern with most of the nanoparticles that uh, he looks at. I think the ones that can be problematic tend to be inorganic nanoparticles. So things like titanium dioxide, which has been banned in France, but other kinds of inorganic nanoparticles that can't get broken down in gastrointestinal tract and get absorbed by your body. If you have things like lipids and protein and polysaccharides, they will tend to get broken down in, the normal, uh, in a normal way in your gastrointestinal tract. Although there they can be some um, potential problems with that as well. So we always have to take that into account when we're developing these new food products. So just to conclude, um, there's a whole series of different organic and inorganic nanoparticles we can use in foods. They can be uh, natural or processed. They have a wide variety of different applications in the food and um, agriculture industry. Um, one of the areas that we've found is very useful for nanotechnology is to encapsulate bioactive components, stabilize them in foods, and then increase their bioavailability after they've been ingested. Um, but in the future, I think we still need to do work to make sure that any of these nanotechnologies are safe for use um, and, and look at their potential toxicity because, you know, we're feeding millions and millions of people and we don't want to have any adverse effects. So just to finish, I'd just like to thank, you know, everybody who's working in my lab and all the people who have uh, sort of contributed to the, to the um, funding the research. So again, thanks very much for listening. I'm sorry again that I was two hours out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you. The very fascinating science of, of nanotechnology in food. So now I would like to invite anyone to ask the questions. Uh, please turn the camera on, unmute yourself and ask a question. Anyone? I'm not sure the other will be brave enough, but uh, due they are thinking of their questions, uh, uh, I will reflect on the last thing uh, Julian said. Um, uh, about the consumer acceptance of nanotechnology. Uh, clearly, maybe this is a future key marketing concert for uh, many consumers because they, they know little or nothing about nanotechnology. And you said, uh, uh, you mentioned this uh, nanotoxicity and other concerns that they have, but also uh, there are plenty of benefits of uh, nanotechnology. You said, uh, uh, of helping uh, the quality, naturalness, um, or bioavailability of food, um, and uh, 
but but how we can overcome the consumer general negative attitudes, values, and cultural norms? Um, yeah, I think, be, I think it's very challenging. I think what are the main key marketing messages so we can, as a researcher, we can communicate to consumers when presenting the applications of nanotechnology for food. And I think what the food industry has largely done is is re rename the. They just don't mention it. So I think you know. I mean, I, when I started working in this area, you know, when I was doing my PhD, we called it colloid science. Mm. So, and it was the same thing. You were just using small particles, and I think it's probably only in the two thousands we were doing very similar stuff, but we just changed it to nanoparticles because you could get more money from the, the government. Uh, so it sounded more interesting research, but. Uh, I think because in Europe there's been a big backlash against nanotechnology in food. So I think food companies are very wary to use nano, put nano on the, on the labels. And I think, you know, you saw a few companies doing it maybe five or 10 years ago, they would say like nano enabled something or other, but I think people have stopped doing that now. And I think it's almost like GMOs. I think it's people have, if you ask most people, they have no clue what nanotechnology is or what nano in foods is. Um, so I don't know, I think you've got to really highlight the benefits. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is... Thank you, is, thank yeah. you Julian. Any, any other question? Julian, maybe I'll ask you, in the, at the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned about uh, natural nanoparticles and you referred to the milk. And we know that the actual milk is heavily processed, is pastor, pasteurized, is homogenized. Some of them are even treated with a very high temperature. Do you think these processes may change actually the structure of these particles, may let's say denaturate them, and this may have the negative impact on, on actually the value, the biological value of milk. Yeah, I, mean, I think you definitely will break down the milk fat globules because they start off in raw milk as being quite large particles, and then they'll get broken down and you change the, um, the surface chemistry of the particles. I mean, you've still got natural proteins there. You've got uh, whey proteins and caseins absorbed to the surface instead of having this complex phospholipid membrane in there. So they will change, they will behave differently biologically. Um, you know, and I, I mean, we weren't, you know, I mean, we're drinking this secretion from a cow's breast anyway, which is a bit unnatural. Um, so I don't know whether, you know, whether it's raw or, or, I mean, I would never eat raw milk. I would want it to be processed mm -hmm. because if you eat raw mil milk, you've got a much higher chance of actually dying from a nasty disease than if you eat homogenized milk. But I think things like the casein micelles are so small that the effects of homogenization are quite small on them. Um, but, you, you know, during heating and all those other processes, you can cause them to partially dissemble. So the composition is similar, but the structure could be slightly different or, or could be quite different. But I don't know if that has a huge nutritional effect. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, any other question? Anyone? I can hear and see any questions. So, please okay. Join. Can I ask one extra? Yes, uh, Julian, you have mentioned that uh, nanotechnology embedded uh, food packaging materials ends up in uh, landfills. And this material can potentially contaminate water supplies and whatever. What are the other potential environmental impact of nanoparticles, if you can think of any? And I think, I mean, first of all, I mean, I think for any nanoparticle, we have to do like a risk benefit analysis. I think that's really important. Um, and I, but I think you have to treat it on a case by case basis. It's really difficult to make sort of generalizations. It's just because it's a nanoparticle, it's bad for you. Um, I mean, I, I think some of them I would be much more concerned about than others. So I think ones that would just degrade in the environment naturally. So if it's made out of proteins or, or polysaccharides or fats, I wouldn't be concerned about it. But if it's made out of, you know, inorganic materials that could persist in the environment, that could be a problem, especially if they've got like strong antimicrobial properties, because they could get right through the food chain, you know, like maybe, you know, bugs eat them, insects eat them, animals eat them, and then eventually humans might mm. eat them. Um, but again, I think the evidence that from the evidence that the science that's been done in that area, it doesn't seem like it's a huge risk, but obviously it's something that we have to address and quantify um, before you. we start use this widely. All right, thank you so much. Um, yes, please. Maybe, can, I, can I just ask one question? Good evening, uh, Julian. Uh, good morning, everyone else. Um, a fantastic uh, presentation. It's been really amazing to watch this kind of explosion of 
scientific effort, mostly on the academic side. So as you pointed out, um, uh, research by commercial companies has been limited because of this question about uh, toxicology and how to measure that. I think, as you said, if you do the standard toxicological tests for food additives, um, you don't find anything, but now people are doing things at the molecular level and trying to see this is a change and maybe that has a toxicological effect or not. So you mentioned TiO2, as you know, EFSA hasn't found any adverse consequences. Uh, so France has decided to ban TiO2 simply because there might be theoretically some consequences, but they, nobody's found them yet. Um, so that's a long introduction to uh, the, the uh, environment question uh, that was posed. Um, and that is, so there was a paper sometime back um, about, uh, I think the title was, uh, where, where are the nanomaterials in our food? Um, and you touched on nat natural nanomaterials. So I, I haven't looked at this in detail, but you know, I guess dirt is more or less everywhere. And um, you know, we, we know about uh, small sized particles in the air. Uh, do we have, uh, you, you start to come in terms of exposure because in toxicology you talk about exposure. Um, we, we don't know what the baseline is, right? So we don't know what nanoparticles we are exposed to naturally. You talked about some in food, uh, but you know, dirt is everywhere, you know, bug pieces are everywhere. Um, so e even conceptually how to, again, establish kind of baseline of where we are um, to address that area. Because as you, you've, you've highlighted some of the many hundreds of potentially useful application areas, but those can't uh, get really taken forward until we have a good uh, agreed framework for the toxicological aspects. And it's hard for me to see how that can be done without some agreement on where we stand in terms of baseline. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I think just as a general comment, I mean, for me, what I, I don't really think of myself as a nanotechnologist. I mean, I would think about more of like I, I'm into structural design, and I think I think that's what I think nanotechnology changed. Is you you know, I don't think anything drastic happens when a particle goes from like 101 nanometers to 99 nanometers. Or if you go from you know like one nanometer to two nanometer, it doesn't. You don't have a drastic change in everything. So for me, what nanotechnology is is actually rationally designing things, is understanding small particles and how to manipulate them, or you know how to create different characteristics in them to create desirable effects or to avoid undesirable effects. So again, and I think that probably bleeds over to toxicology as well. Is like, are we just arbitrarily choosing like this particular size range and then suddenly thinking we have to do everything different now because we're in this size range? But, you know, we've always had things in that size range. I mean, molecules would be the ultimate nanoparticle, you know, like a protein is two nanometers. So if we stopped eating proteins, we'd all die. Uh, right, exactly. And, and that's, you know, you're right, it is a bit artificial. So, so as you know, I have a chemical background and, you know, in, in chemistry, I mean, it's what a quote you, you mentioned, I mean, protein of two nanometers, uh, uh, I think water is a probably a quarter of a nanometer. So, you know, it, it, we, we deal with chemical reactions all the time. And we're not so concerned about the size of, of those molecules or elements in, in terms of defining their use or or potential toxicology. So yeah, that's an important point. Fantastic. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I think this is a very good point. If you would like to have a bit of the conversation on this, I'm more than happy to take the conversation offline with you. I can uh, talk through these baselines and the baselines are actually different in different places around the world. Uh, so I'm more than happy to talk you through with the toxicology aspect of nanotechnology but we'll do it offline probably. Great, Let, let's do that. I, um, uh, I, I don't want to promote anything, but just to mention, some people may be interested. Uh, so the Singapore Food uh, Agency um, is uh, together with some other institutes um, and the institute that I work with, the uh, International Life Science Institute, uh, they're having a workshop in January on, uh, on nanotechnology and food and agriculture and Professor McClements has agreed to present for that. Um, so, so there is interest kind of formulating in the background, but as I said, as far as my observation is the commercial interest is, is still inhibited by a lack of a uh, framework and, and companies of course have to be careful not to, uh, uh, not to uh, uh, proceed uh, with too much uncertainty. Yeah, thank you so much. 
All right, I think with this one, I would like, um, please join me to thank you, thank uh, Julian for a wonderful talks, you know, last week and this week. So thank you so much, Julian, it was absolutely wonderful. It was a, a feast for us here to have you and to learn about first future foods and now the nanotechnology in food. So we really appreciate your presence uh, being with us. So we hope that the, the election will be resolved soon so we can go to bed. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending and we will be sending you the recording very soon. Thank you. Right. And I hope yeah, well, thank you very much for having, having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.